Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruth Dickey. I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of Seattle Arts and Lectures and serving on the board of AWP. And on behalf of the board, I'm delighted to welcome you to My Heart is Not Blind, a panel presented by Trinity University Press. Uh, this event is being live streamed, so welcome to our audience members who are here and our virtual audience members all across the ether. A few, just five quick housekeeping items as we get started. First, thank you all for being here. At times of confusion and fear, we need community and art and story more than ever, so thank you for being here with us. Second, please take a moment and silence your phones. Third, please remember no flash photography is allowed during the panel. Fourth, uh, please say, stay safe while you're here at AWP with plenty of hand washing and uh, elbow greetings. Um, and five, after the event, our speakers will be signing books in the lobby, but please give them a few moments to make it to the table before you come with um, wonderful questions and praise for their panel. To officially introduce our panel and start things this morning, I'm pleased to introduce Marguerite Avery, who is the Senior Acquisitions Editor at Trinity University Press. Please join me in welcoming Marguerite. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Michael Nye, who is the author and photographer of My Heart is Not Blind and Blindness and Perception. Uh, Michael and I practiced law for about 10 years before pursuing photography full-time. He has received a Mid-America National Endowments for the Arts grant in photography and two Kronkowski Charitable Foundation grants. Michael has participated in two Art America tours in the Middle East and Asia. His work has taken him around the world. His documentaries, photography, and audio exhibitions, which are Children of Children, Stories of Teenage Pregnancy, and Fine Line, mental health, mental illness, and about hunger and resilience, resilience, have traveled to more than 150 cities around the country and continue to travel. My Heart Is Not Blind is published by Trinity University Press, and it is also an audio and photography exhibition that is currently touring around the country. We have a capsule exhibition of this here in the exhibit hall right behind the Trinity University Press booth. If you have a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. Uh, and I was awarded the Dr. Jacob Bulletin Award from the National Federation of the Blind in 2019. Michael Nye lives downtown in, San, down, <clears throat> excuse me, in downtown San Antonio, who's actually my neighbor, and married to poet Naomi Shabab Nye. Um, as a child, Michael was called Mikey, and in middle age, went to Michael, and now he's come back full circle as Mikey. Please join me in welcoming Michael Nye. Thank you, Marguerite. One thing I'm certain about is that coronavirus cannot eliminate the human touch. Thank you, AWP, for all you do. And someone from AWP just a few minutes ago told me something I did not know, that March 7th, 2020, today, is the National Frozen Food Day. Congratulations to all the frozen foods in San Antonio, especially strawberries. Welch Diamond, psychologist and photographer, lived in England in 1850. He said it's quite possible to look at someone without seeing them at all. And it's quite possible to listen to someone without hearing them. Discovery or rediscovery comes from a change in perspective. Our panel this morning will offer a shift and swerve in perspective. How does anyone, blind or sighted, understand the world outside themselves? The book, My Heart Is Not Blind, is both a traveling audio and photography exhibition and a book published by Trinity, Tom Payton, a wonderful director, and I feel so lucky to be associated with them. Before introducing the panel, I want to speak for just a few minutes about the nature of this project. It's about blindness close up, not from a distance. It's about the nature of blindness, the nature of perception, the mystery of perception and adaptation, the brain's ability to rewire itself to favor non-visual thinking and orientation. It's about our shared humanity, it is, and our shared fragility. And it's about, I think, a hunger to know more, to do more, to have greater compassion and understanding. 
and more than anything, it's the grave, grave, grave misunderstanding about the nature of blindness and the discrimination. And I say that with all of my might and strength. The introduction to my book, I write, not all blind people are blind and not all sighted people can see. That's true. Knowing what the world looks like is not a requirement for understanding, our determination, our wisdom, our compassion, our intellect. My ears saw so much more than my eyes during the seven years I worked on this project. How is perception increased from a cultivation of attention? Why does the general public carry such prejudice? Blindness is not what the public thinks it is. It's something else. Michael Hinkson, on September 11, 2001, 9-11, was on the 78th floor of Tower One when the first plane struck. He said, the whole building started to shudder and creak and groan. He said, I felt like the building was swaying up to 20 feet back and forth. He was with his guide dog, Roselle, born blind, he said that because of his teamwork, he paid attention. And it's attention for all of us that changes us, always. He knew exactly at that moment how many steps it took from floor 78 to the lobby because he paid attention. Michael told me the biggest problem that he faces, that blind people face, is not blindness, but what sighted people think of blindness. That's profound. To understand another person, you must consider things from his or her point of view. The last thing I want to say before introducing our great panel is W.S. Merwin, poet, lived in Hawaii with his wife Paula. They created a palm sanctuary. For 40 years, they planted more than 3,000 trees endangered palms. William was going blind. A year and a half before he died, I flew to Maui and spent the day with William and Paula. And I asked him questions about loss of eyesight, about a shift in perception. William talked about rain turning into streams. He talked about dragonflies flying sideways and backwards. He talked about the wisdom of trees, that trees are our teachers. And he talked about images, the sounds of a shadow, shape, and destination. He raised his voice and raised his hands over his head, and he said, we have to pay better attention in our short lives. And then he talked about making mistakes, a poem he wrote, To the Mistakes, and I want to read just the last few lines of that poem. You, the mistakes, are the ones I have needed the ones that led me in spite of all that was said about you. You, the mistakes, placed my footsteps on the only way. Thank you again for being here. And I want to introduce our great panel. Larry Johnson is on the far left. Larry has a master's degree in economics and Latin American studies from the University of Americas in Mexico City. He has spent 23 years as a radio and television broadcaster in U.S. and Mexico, and once you hear his voice, you'll know why. He has been a human resource manager, AT&T, Southwestern Bell. He's the author of seven books, the last one, the most recent, That's How I See It, a collection of essays published by the San Antonio Express News. Larry's a close friend. He's funny and a tireless encourager to many. Natalie Watkins has a long and diverse professional background. She was a model at one time, taught in public schools, personal finance counselor, licensed stockbroker. I'm getting tired. Natalie has served as an advocate for so many capacities. She writes poetry and prose, married to Ed, who's here, has two teenagers. She's driven, and I say that in all possible ways. Natalie has a great laugh, and she says of herself, she has a dark sense of humor. And we also have Mario Aguirre, went to the University of, South, of North Texas, obtained a master's degree in education. He has a counselor's license from the University of Houston. Currently, he's a therapist at, at a San Antonio nonprofit agency, Rape Crisis Center, and he's worked there and listened there for 22 years. He has many interests, a drummer, 
reads science fiction, Jungian psychology, walks the street of San Antonio with his guide dog. He's married to Miranda Key, who is with us. And I must say that Mario is one of the most extraordinary listeners I have ever met. So I'm going to move to my chair. <coughs> and I'd like to start off with Larry Johnson. Larry, you mentioned that your first career was in radio and television, 22 years, Mexico, I think mostly. In your narrative in the book, you mentioned that listening to the radio as a child, baseball games, mystery stories fueled your imagination. How did radio broadcasters and stories influence you? Oh, good morning, Michael. I would say three ways. First of all, I grew up during the golden age of radio, back in the 40s and early 50s. And there were all kinds of radio shows back then, especially for kids. They stimulated and expanded my imagination I loved the adventure shows, shows like The Lone Ranger and Buck Rogers and The Superman. They were able to take you in a strange way. You felt where they took you, to the jungles of South America or to the mountains or wherever. And through the sounds and the description, the words of those actors and announcers, I was transported. It truly was a theater of the mind. Secondly, the hero figures of those shows taught me powerful lessons, lessons about courage and loyalty and honesty and integrity. They were fantastic role models. And I carried those lessons and that philosophy uh, throughout my life. And thirdly, I saw in radio something that I could do. I could talk on the radio and, and no one would know that I was blind. And in fact, the many, many years that I worked in radio, most of my listening audience didn't know that I couldn't see, and it didn't matter. Thank you, Larry. Natalie, you're the only one in the book that's in there twice, and I interviewed you six or seven years ago when you were visually impaired, and then again when you were totally blind. Six or seven years ago when you were visually impaired, you said, no matter what joy there is in life, there's this constant nefarious monster of blindness threatening. It's very frightening, terrifying. No, I don't want to lose my sight. Now, six years later, you've traveled from visual impairment to total blindness. And I want to ask you a question about fear, the nature of fear of going blind. Was it realistic? Do you live with fear now? Well, um, thank you, Michael. I believe that the fear is far worse than the reality of blindness. Living with the fear of going blind was infinitely harder than living with the reality of being blind. Um, yes, being blind is massively inconvenient. Um, everything requires more effort, more thought, um, more patience, but it is simply a new way of being in the world, a new way of perceiving the world and a new way of managing and coping, as opposed to slowly losing my sight and living in terror of an unknown future reality, um, which was quite torturous on, on some level at the risk of sounding dramatic, so. Mario, in your narrative, you said, I think in a more enlightened society and perhaps in a more enlightened time, Blindness can have a positive side in terms of a deeper understanding. Can you talk about blindness that can lead us to a, 
all of us to a deeper understanding. And what does the public not understand about blindness? Firstly, um, I feel that society's negative attitudes toward blindness um, has an adverse impact on us because we tend to internalize those negative thoughts and, and beliefs about ourselves. And that is very wounding to one's self-esteem, to one's self-image, to one's self-acceptance. And so, at least I can speak for myself, for me, being blind was a tremendous, and continues to be a tremendous struggle because um, wanting to feel, quote, unquote, normal, or wanting to be accepted as, as a, just as a person uh, has been qu quite a challenge, tremendous challenge. Uh, to overcome my low self-esteem and poor self-image and, and, and actually have the courage to go forth into the unknown and develop my human potential. In terms of un a deeper understanding, um, when I was uh, a senior in high school, uh, my condition was finally diagnosed. I had macular degeneration, juvenile macular degeneration, and I was told that eventually I would lose all of my sight. Now, at that point, I was faced with some heavy existential questions like, uh, how am I going to survive? What am I going to do? How am I going to navigate through this human condition blind. I was terrified. And this blindness, this catastrophic disability gave me, afforded me the opportunity to begin to seek some sort of understanding considering my existential condition and that enabled me to looked to the East and I uh, studied Hinduism, Buddhism, in more particular uh, Zen and Tibetan Buddhism. And in my quest to understand this condition and how to cope and, and maybe even thrive uh, in my studies, uh, broadened my perspective and understanding of this human condition and, and beyond. So this catastrophic disability offered me the incredible opportunity to, to go beyond this ordinary reality and explore the spirit realm or non-ordinary reality. So that gave me a not only a better understanding, but it, it enabled me to make my suffering meaningful. Thank you, Mario. Larry, I interviewed Burns Taylor from El Paso, who's age 77. When Burns was three years old, his older brother, 11, found a loaded gun Burns was shot in the face, and the doctors removed both his eyes. He's been a teacher at the college level. Burns said, for him, the existential question is, how do you live with something where society makes you feel you should be ashamed of, that you're not equal to them? Larry, how do you deal with misunderstandings and stereotypes by the general public? What are the most misunderstood notions you think there are about blindness? Well, I, there are really two, uh, two major attitudinal problems that I think that uh, society has. The attitude is really the single most important aspect of a, uh, of a person's life and their approach to life because we cannot control 
what happens to us or around us, but we can control how we react or respond to it. You know, my mom had a phrase, she used to say, life's too short. If something bad happens to you, deal with it, and then get over it. And I'm an optimist. I, I choose to believe in the goodness of people and in the positive outcome of most situations. Because to believe otherwise is to invite despair. So I think that uh, the two most important things that the person learns is that we are just like other people. I think that uh, the misperception is that blind people are different from sighted people, but we're not. We have many of the same hopes and dreams and abilities as sighted people do. And we also have many of the same foibles. We can be annoying, we can be obnoxious, we can be, lose our tempers. And so we're no different in that regard. And the second misperception is that all blind people are the same. And again, we're not. We come in all shapes and sizes. In fact, uh, each of us is a snowflake, uniquely different. My blindness is not the whole of me, it is just a part of me. Like my big feet, my dislike of liver, and so don't compare me to someone else. See me as me. Nice. Natalie, after you lost all of your remaining usable vision, you went to Chris Cole Center for the Blind in Austin, and you said at the Chris Cole Center, I met people for the first time as a totally blind person. What was that experience like? Michael, that was one of the most moving and phenomenal experiences of my life. Um, to meet people without regards for physical appearance was very freeing. I made soul-to-soul -soul connections without any regard to um, a person's background, which was just liberating on so many levels. I made deep quality bonds with people. Um, the level of superficiality was so much less than when I was sighted. And not that I consciously judged people based on appearance when I was sighted, but there were so many visual details that you just couldn't help taking in and making assessments, whether that's consciously or subconsciously. And to not do that and to meet these people from a variety of backgrounds and all of us sharing in this common struggle um, was a really beautiful and profound experience for me. It was very special. Uh, Mario, I learned a lot from you in our conversations that we had. I learned that listening is an act of kindness, that listening is not being quiet, but it's being present. You said, I think listening is a rare quality. Carl Jung believed that listening is such a rare quality that people have to pay for it in therapy. You're a therapist. You've been listening to survivors of sexual trauma for 21 years. Can you talk about the nature of listening and why you think it's so important? Yeah. Carl Rogers, uh, believe that there's a certain amount of risk involved in allowing oneself to truly listen to someone else. And unless you're willing to take that risk, you cannot afford to listen truly to someone else. And the risk entails the willingness to face the possibility that what the person has to say or share with you can have a changing effect on you. 
And unless you're willing to face that risk, that it might change you. And as a therapist, I work with very wounded souls and, and um, sometimes I'm deeply moved by their pain and sorrow. So there's a big risk in allowing oneself to allow another soul to open their hearts and share and, and also to be able to be present to their suffering. So yes, listening is, is quite a challenge and risk. Uh, Larry, you are a master storyteller, and we've had breakfast for the, you know, off and on for the last six years together. Mm -hmm. Stories are windows into a larger world than our own, and I think they can liberate us, remove the boundaries and barriers between ourselves and others. You tell a story about when you were 16 and you acquired a guide dog by the name of Sasha. Did you gain independence or freedom as a result of your relationship with Sasha? Oh, yes. Did you, did you travel together? Immensely so. You know, I had been fairly independent um, growing up as a blind child, and I knew my neighborhood pretty well, and I could get around. I had still some vision at the time, and so I didn't use a cane until I was like, uh, oh, maybe 15. I, and, but I still was limited in my ability to get around familiar territories. Well, when I, when I got Tasha, the whole world opened up for me. We used to take walks, I mean, five and six miles and we would venture into neighborhoods that I'd never been to before. And I felt this tremendous sense of maturity and independence. And we went to college together. I went to Northwestern University, which is a huge campus along the shore of Lake Michigan. It stretches for about a half a mile. And to go from, from uh, class to class, you have to talk, ta uh, talk uh, I mean, take long walks. And Tasha was up to it, and she was able to guide me up and down that campus. By the way, she also <clears throat> attracted a lot of um, co-eds to come and approach and ask questions, which was a benefit, and I thanked her for that, too. Um, then at 18, I decided I wanted to take a trip far away. And I'd been studying Spanish and listening to Spanish radio and, and learning about Spanish culture in college. And I thought, what a better thing to do than to learn Spanish by going to Mexico. And so I made the decision that I would take a trip to Mexico with Tasha. And back then, back in the 1950s, it was possible to travel by train from Chicago all the way to Mexico City. And so we did. Well, <clears throat> we were twice left by the train in Mexico when I had to get off with Tasha. And that was scary. I was only 18 and my Spanish was only textbook level and uh, I survived it. We, we got to Mexico City, and I traveled to museums and to churches, to shrines and to marketplaces, and all of that I did alone with Tasha. So it was a tremendous experience, and much, much later I wrote a book about it, and it was called Mexico by Touch, and uh, some of the story I tell in the narrative, if you want to listen to the uh, narrative at My Heart Is Not Blind, I'll 
share it with you at that point. But it was a truly liberating experience to have my guide dog. Natalie, in your narrative, you said I'm a very visual person. And most of my memories are visual in nature. And you talked about when your vision was better, you went on a trip with your grandmother to Rome and the Vatican City. You were in the Sistine Chapel. The bus was about to leave and you said, I didn't care. I was completely and totally swept away by the experience. You said you cried because of that incredible, beautiful human work. Can you talk about both being blind and being visual at the same time? Yes, those um, visual memories of profound beauty are something I absolutely treasure. And um, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is one that I think of often. I also saw a beautiful lightning storm at sea once uh, from a ship, and that's another visual memory that I treasure. Um, obviously, the faces of my children and my husband are visual memories that I treasure. And to be honest, I, I don't know of a substitute for those. I do know that I appreciate um, music on new levels, and I have a more of a sense of sound um, now that I am blind and more of an appreciation for for the arts that focus on sound. Uh, but there are those experiences of stunning visual beauty uh, that I will absolutely treasure forever and I don't take any of them for granted. So um, I consider myself very fortunate that I had that opportunity to make those memories. Um, and, and I still do imagine things visually in my head. Um, even though I feel relatively free by not judging people by appearance, I still have a mental picture of what people look like when I meet them, even though it's probably entirely inaccurate. Uh, it's still how I perceive the world around me. I have a mental picture of this theater, even though um, I don't have strong memories of it from when I was sighted. So even as I go through the world, my mind is still mapping things out in a visual way. Mario, you've talked about the desert a lot. Mm -hmm. You've taken many trips to the deserts in New Mexico, and you've talked about experiencing a deep sense of spirituality there, the presence of a desert, the Apache people, the mountains, the wind, can you speak about your experience there and why you returned to the deserts and eastern New Mexico again and again? As a matter of fact, I was there last week. <laughs> there is a good reason why New Mexico is known as the land of enchantment. And I have always experienced New Mexico as a land of enchantment. There is a, a deep sense of spirituality there. And ironically enough, the first nuclear weapon introduced into this human realm was exploded in New Mexico in the white sands. Such a paradox. Such a, such a land of deep spirituality, Native American, Spanish, Mexican, American, and yet the door there was open to, to the nuclear age, such paradox. But apart from that, um, a good friend of mine bought an old adobe home in a canyon known as Canyonosa Alamosa, or they changed it to, uh, uh, to, oh, I can't remember what they changed the name to, but 
anyway, it was uh, the homeland of the uh, easternmost band, eastern band of the Chiricahuas. Um, and that canyon was their, uh, their land. And, uh, and so when I discovered that reality, I, the Apache people are my spirit people. So uh, visiting that canyon would in, uh, allow me the opportunity to, to get in touch with a deep sense of spirit there. And, and yes, 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 the Apache spirits still, still live there. There's this w wonderful spring, it's called warm, it's a, it's a warm spring and, and that's where the Apaches there they got their name from the Warm Spring Apaches, and uh, and and I love going there because there is a sound to that silence in the desert, and and yes, it's it's haunting in some way. Larry. Everyone's experienced setbacks, rejections, and failures. W.S. Merwin wrote a poem about our mistakes, his mistakes. Would you talk about the importance of attitude, your attitude in life, and how you've dealt with your disappointments, if you've had any? Oh, yes. <laughs> but many disappointments. Uh, you know, girls I've asked to go out and said, no, I'm sure that never happened to anybody in the audience, right? You know, when you get up in the morning, you have a choice each day. You have a choice of how you want that day to be. And you can choose to look at that day as a day that prevents, presents challenges and disappointments and roadblocks and obstacles or or you can choose to look at that day as a day of opportunity and adventure and excitement. And so your attitude is within your hands, really within your mind, and you can have a positive or a negative attitude every minute. Everything that happens to us, we can look at it in two ways. We can look at it as a problem or we can look at it as an opportunity. You know, I've had so many occasions in my life when a seeming obstacle or barrier has turned into an opportunity. I think another thing that's important about attitude is that you have to have a sense of humor. You have to be willing to laugh at yourself, at your foibles, at your mistakes, at the strange consequences of your actions. And if you have that sense of humor, you can conquer any obstacle because it becomes inconsequential. It becomes less important. So many things happen to me, uh, as a blind person, but they happen to other people too. You know, I pride myself on how well I am organized. I label things and I always return them to the same place that they were. Well, almost. Now the other day, I decided to add some mayonnaise to the chicken sandwich that I was having for lunch. And so, I opened the refrigerator, I reached in to grab the plastic squeeze bottle of mayonnaise, I squeezed a generous amount on my chicken sandwich, and then I took a big bite. And that's when I discovered that I had drenched my chicken sandwich with butterscotch syrup. <laughs> it was the same kind of bottle. I simply forgot to sniff before squeezing. You know, maybe I could offer the recipe to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> 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 
Natalie, maybe the word perspective is the most important word in the English language because it changes us. This is a hard question. You have had full sight when you were a child in early teenage years and then many, many years visually impaired and now blind. How has your perspective about life and meaning changed as a result of your vision loss over time? It has changed profoundly. I think um, I have been through a fire of sorts and I do believe um, at the risk of sounding arrogant that I have emerged a kinder, wiser version of myself for having been through that struggle. I have met people that I never would have met otherwise, such as Larry, um, who have inspired me to be the best version of myself. I've had to dig deeper and define what it means to be human. I've had to really look myself square in the eye, if you'll allow the horrendous pun, and uh, really think about what it means to me to have worth as a human being. Is it based on being like everyone else? Is it based on doing things the way everyone else does them? Or does my worth lie in something far deeper and on a spiritual level? And I've done a lot of searching for meaning. I think, as Mario mentioned, the existential struggle that all of us live with as human beings. And I feel like blindness has given me an opportunity to really plunge depths that I never would have before. Because to be quite honest, things were just easy. And um, when there is no struggle, there is no resulting strength. So um, that's been my experience, if that answers the question. Yeah, good. Uh, Mario, you talked a lot about your childhood uh, when you were fully sighted about going to a segregated elementary school. You said the teachers were all white and the students had brown faces. You said I was lost. Now someone may see you walking down the street and say there's a blind man. Identity is complex. We're all many things. How would you describe your own identity? That's a good question. <laughs> I think of myself, and as Larry says, yes, a part of me is, is blind. Another part of me is not. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a Chicano, I'm a husband, I'm a counselor. I'm a, a child of the universe. I'm a Buddhist. I'm a citizen of Earth. So my identity certainly transcends the limitation of, of blindness. I am so much more. I'm everything and I'm nothing. So there's the irony. Larry, you were the first person I interviewed in the seven years working on this project. And I remember it was a summer day. I walked in the house, and it was, to me, pitch black. <laughs> All the blinds were down. I stumbled, almost fell over. You were on your computer making coffee, cooking breakfast, rocking and rolling, and I couldn't even find the plug. And I thought to myself, OK, who's got the advantage here? Have you had times in your life you've wished for eyesight, felt sorry for yourself? What have you longed for in life? No, I have not longed for eyesight. But not being able to see has deprived me of certain experiences, like those that Natalie talked about like being able to perceive the magnitude and beauty of a sunrise or a sunset, a sky full of stars, a rainbow, a Russian ballet, the view from an airplane flying over a mountain range, or the magic and mystery 
reflected in a loved one's eyes. No. I miss those experiences. I don't know what they would be like, but I am curious. And yet, I think that as a blind person, I can perceive and appreciate more, for example, the tactile aspects of a handmade quilt, the delicious aroma of a freshly baked bread, the full-throated voice of a symphony orchestra, or the exquisite taste of a gourmet meal. The advantages of blindness allow me to be able to read Braille in the dark or under the covers as I used to do when I was a kid so my mom wouldn't know that I was still awake and reading my favorite book. And by being freed of the distractions of visual images and messages in our surroundings, a blind person can perhaps find it more easily to concentrate, to focus more deeply on his or her thoughts or problems or plans or hopes or dreams. That there can be a definite advantage for a writer, a composer, or even a philosopher. Natalie, I want to talk about adaptation. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Frances Fuente, and she said, I know how it feels to be sighted and to be blind. It's like stepping from one dimension to another. It's like being bilingual. I could either speak to someone in Spanish or speak to someone in English. Blindness is a different language. I know both sides, dark and light. I also interviewed Katie Kim in Honolulu. She lives right on the base of Diamond Head Crater, right in Waikiki. And she said, I don't wish blindness on anyone because our world's not set up for the blind. I remember it took me seven years almost to the day of losing my vision when I woke up and thought, okay, I'm normal again. I began the next chapter of feeling normal, integrated in my community, equal with my sighted peers. When you lose your vision as an adult, suddenly you're a child again, relearning, she said. Blindness has given me a different form of stability, an ability to use my innate strength of endurance in ways I never could imagine. Can you talk about your own experience adapting to your different situations with vision loss? Yes. Well. Um my period of adaptation was gradual for a long time. As I started my life with uh, relatively normal vision with the exception of night blindness. And then through my teenage years and 20s, my peripheral vision slowly deteriorated and I was left with tunnel vision that was quite good. I had pretty good uh, central acuity, so I was still able to function visually even though I was quite impaired until around three years ago when everything fogged over. Basically a pea soup fog haze rolled in and I was unable to see at all. And the difference between being partially sighted and having no usable vision is very dramatic, even though I was legally blind. Um, there were small changes that I made along the way where those adaptations didn't feel quite so dramatic. Um, my contrast vision was very poor, so I simply changed the settings on my computer to white on black so there was more contrast. I can make small changes in my home, like increasing my level of organization or using a black cutting board for light-colored items. There were a series of small adjustments along the way that made life run relatively smoothly. And it wasn't until I lost my vision entirely that I really had to dig deep and look at my own ability to adapt and overcome and come face to face with my own limitations, both uh, physically and emotionally. 
but I think um, what can be incredibly powerful are the people you surround yourself with. And um, two of the other participants in My Heart Is Not Blind have become very close friends of mine and an encouragement, including this man sitting to my right here. Um, he's an encouragement to many people, so I'm not gonna cry. Oh, or knock down water, but it looks <laughs> like I did both. Um, so it's just uh, a matter of finding the right encouragement, finding the right rehabilitation. I went to Chris Cole Rehab Center in Austin where I stayed for two weeks so I could learn to do simple tasks like checking my email with a talking computer which uses keyboard navigation instead of a mouse. I mean, every little task that you can think of has to be relearned in a novel way. And life doesn't slow down to give you the opportunity to do that. There is no remote control with a pause button where you can just stop the obligations of daily life so you can learn to be blind. Life goes on in the midst of it. So it has been a real trial. It has been a real test, um, but I have had an amazing support system in my family, in my friends, and mentors who are blind, who have been a huge help and um, just a tireless encouragement to me. And I, I'm still adapting. I've been totally blind for three years. I have very rudimentary skills on a lot of fronts, um, but I'm able to function, I'm able to manage a family and that's because of the efforts of a lot of kind and generous and well-informed people. So it's, it's, I'm still very much in process. Mario, perception, as you've talked about earlier, is deeper than we can imagine and much more mysterious. Our other senses have their own wisdom separate from sight. Our eyes miss so much. I met Virgil Stinnett, and he said, I'm a firm believer that everything has an energy, whether it's a dead tree, a pole, an iron, or a person. I could walk by people and not even physically touch them, but could feel their energy coming off them. Juanito Castillo said, I can hear an echo bounce back. I can locate the distance between myself and a wall, a mailbox, a car. It's almost like not seeing a shadow but hearing a shadow. You said in your narrative, I see colors outside of myself. Open eyes, close eyes, it doesn't matter. It does, I, I see greens and blues and reds all around me. Blindness has been an asset in the work that I do. How has your sense of perception changed since your vision loss? Let me begin by saying that um, I was very fortunate to have had the opportunity to experience a, a, um, a Jungian analysis. Uh, oh, I spent many years in analysis with a wonderful senior analyst, Mary Eileen Dobson. But early on in my analysis, I had this dream and what it said to me, in essence, was this. It said, yes, you are losing your outer vision, but you will gain an inner vision in compensation, or worse to that effect. And over the years, I began to realized that I was able to, or am able to perceive colors. Now, I had normal vision up until the age of 12, so I, I know colors. I, so I started observing colors around people and just, just in nature. And uh, for a long time, I, 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 doubt, I doubted that. I, I, doubted that I was actually seeing what I thought I was seeing, but eventually I came to the understanding, no, no, this is, this is real. And, and it's a kind of vision not necessarily associated with my eyeballs. I think it's a vision associated more with what's referred to as the third eye. 
And um, so I began to pay attention to such colors. And as in time, in researching, I, I came to the understanding that, um, that we have energy centers referred to as chakras. And, and each chakra generates a, 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 a different electromagnetic energy field that can be perceived as a color. And so I began to especially be able to perceive the color red, bright blood colored red, which is uh, associated with the root chakra. And interestingly, the population I work with uh, who are deeply wounded sexually um, relates to that root chakra. So I pay attention to the, um, the energy around my clients, especially uh, the red energy and, and, uh, and the release or discharge of that energy in the work I do. Uh, the other energy center that I focus in is the heart and the, co and the color of the heart chakra is green. And, and I focus in developing that green color, which is to say I focus on developing my heart consciousness, my heart energy. And it's been very helpful in the work I do because I pay attention to the changing colors around a person and from that I can ascertain what's going on. For example, persons in deep, emotional pain will tend to have this dark energy around them and it does look like those little cartoon figures with a little dark cloud over them. That's what it looks like. So the cartoonist had some insight into emotional pain. So um, I pay attention to, to the, the energy fields around a person to cue me into what may be happening or what my, per, my client may be experiencing. And uh, so it's become a good diagnostic tool for me in the work I do. Um, we just have a few minutes left. And Natalie, you said the same thing that almost everyone said, or many people have said. One of the biggest problems I face is not the actual loss of sight, which is, you said is definitely challenging for you, but it's the public's perception. You said you went to a doctor one time, mm -hmm. and she told you if I were in your situation, I would jump off a building. Yes, it was, I, a, it was a psychiatrist actually, uh, yes. And you've had other really cruel and uh, things said to you. Uh, you said I was struck silent, not quite the encouragement you were looking for. You <laughs> laughed to try to diffuse a situation. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with those th kinds of... To be honest, I'm still grappling with what is the, great, the best approach to take with really insensitive comments. Because like in the case of the psychiatrist who told me if she was me, she would jump off a building. You know, I sat back and I thought, where is she coming from? And I thought, you know, I think she was genuinely trying to empathize with me and say, gosh, if I were in your situation, I would be so distraught. I've had people call me and say, I don't know how you get out of bed. If I were you, I'd be sobbing in my bed all day, you know. Um, and I think it's their attempt to try to show compassion or empathy. Um, but it is really unhelpful. Um, pity is totally unproductive and it just makes the person on the receiving end feel diminished and small and insignificant. And um, I, so I'm still really working through the best approach when I, I'm usually I'm so stunned that I'm in a rare point of silence, a rare state of silence I should say, because it, I'm just dumbstruck that people react in that way, but it's not at all uncommon. It's not at all uncommon. Um, I'm going to ask if there's any questions from the audience, but in closing, I asked everyone I met 
What is blindness not? What is blindness not over the seven years? Blindness not, is not akin to death. It's not being buried alive. It's not blackness. It's not darkness forever. It's not fear. It doesn't break you. It's not a life of misery. Blindness is not the end of the world. It's not the end of one's life. Blindness doesn't define me. It's a characteristic. Blindness is not a door that's locked, and it's not the last act. Robert Dittman, who is a comic, stand-up comic and an attorney, not sure those two go together, <laughs> said, the one thing I really want people to understand is to step out of your dependence on vision. Go sit in a dark room for an hour and open your ears and listen. Go touch something. Of course you're not experiencing true blindness, but at least it's a glimpse into our world. It's not a terrible place. It's not a horrible, miserable world that we exist in. It's a beautiful world, an exciting, adventurous world, a vibrant world, just as relevant as a sighted world. It's different, but not less. Thank you all so much for being here. A great panel. If anyone has a question, we have a few more minutes. Um, we would love, you could ask Larry or Natalie or Mario a question. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm training to be a writing and composition teacher at the university level. And I was wondering, <coughs> what can I do to make sure that blind students feel welcome and are able to succeed in higher education? How blind students can be encouraged? Um, just like make sure they feel welcome and that they have the tools to succeed. So the tools. Sure. and feel welcome. Natalie? I can speak to that. Um, I was in graduate school uh, when I lost my vision completely. And I think um, being as accommodating as possible and realizing that there's responsibility on the part of both parties. So it's their responsibility to approach you at the beginning of the semester uh, with documentation about what accommodations they will be needing. And then, um, and it sounds like you are very open and accommodating as well. So uh, there are a lot of issues with inaccessible technology sometimes. So it's making sure that any articles you post on um, platforms such as Blackboard or Canva or whatever you're using are fully accessible. And um, the Disabled Student Services Office can work with you on a lot of those issues as well and alleviate some of those concerns. But I think dialogue is key and making sure that the articles you're posting are fully accessible um, because there's different ways that PDFs are structured and you know there's a lot of technical details, but it doesn't need to be that complicated if the dialogue is started early. You're a teacher? What? Training. She's in training right now. Oh, good. Um, the most important thing that teachers need to keep in mind, and parents as well, is that blind people learn a little differently than sighted people. And so you have to bring things to the child for them to touch and to learn. You need to learn how to describe things verbally, pictures. Pictures are important, but you have to learn how to, to describe those details in ways that a child can understand. My mother was particularly good at that. When she would take me to the store, she would place my hands on things. For, as she told me, this is, a, this is a pot, this is a fork, this is a, a car. She would stop people on the street and say, uh, Mr. Policeman, can my son touch your badge and see what a policeman's badge feels like, that's what you need to do. Bring the world to their fingertips. Yeah, what grade level is it, if you don't mind me asking? Um, this would be first year composition in university. Okay, so, so it's university. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I would say um, what I found it very helpful 
is to, as an instructor, to be open and accepting and don't make a big deal out of it. And that is helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Hello. Could you talk about learning how to read Braille and what that process is like? Any one of you. About learning to read Braille. Larry actually attempted to teach me Braille. <laughs> so that's a wonderful <laughs> conversation topic. Um, I found it to be very difficult, but uh, some people take to it, it's like anything else. Some people take to it uh, seamlessly and it comes easily to them. I know a lot of people that learn as adults, um, it tends to be a slower process, obviously, than people that learn as children with all that beautiful neuroplasticity that kids have. So um, it's still a process for me. I, I worked on it for a number of years. I'm able to use it as a labeling device, so I can use it to make lists and labels and that type of thing. Uh, but I rely on technology far more so. Um, you know, they have uh, different identifiers and you can program in different SKU numbers into devices and phones that will identify items and that type of thing. I, I rely on that technology much more than I do Braille, but I went blind as an adult and attempted to learn as an adult. And Larry's experience has been very different. Braille is a tremendous tool to literacy because Braille allows you to know how words are spelt that may sound alike if you're listening to an audio uh, book, for example. Braille allows you to have notes, as I have, and to refer to those notes so that you don't overextend yourself or forget something that you wanted to say. So, do not dismiss Braille as being obsolete. It is very, very much an important tool for communication. It may be hard for some folks, and they may not become prolific uh, readers of Braille, but however they use it, to whatever degree, to label um, medicines or, or spices in the kitchen, it is going to be very, very valuable. Any last question? I think we have a few minutes left. There's a lot of talk these days about neuroplasticity, and I was wondering for those of you who are not born blind, which it sounds like at least two, um, did you, you've talked about other senses coming to the fore. Was there any, did you feel that process as it was happening? What was that like to sort of make that shift from sighted dependence so much on being sighted than to not have sight. Um, just a question about uh, the changing perception, neuroplasticity, and how one changes from sighted to blind and, and what happens. Um, well, kind of hop in here. One thing that I've noticed, um, the, I don't know that I notice that my senses are heightened necessarily but I do notice that I rely on them and pay much more attention to them, and I pick up on sounds in the environment more than my sighted peers do. Also, one thing that improved a lot after losing my vision was my memory, my working memory, just because I, it wasn't as easy to jot things down on a piece of paper and rely on my vision to um, organize my day, I started retaining a lot more just mentally and being able to recall things. I was really, it was very difficult and it was a struggle at first, but I was really surprised over the course of a couple of years what a difference, just that daily exercise of using my memory more and more, uh, what a difference that did make. And now I, that's the most dramatic difference I've noticed between being sighted and uh, totally blind has been the differential in my memory. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Larry. Thank you all for being here. Books are being sold out front. We all would be willing to sign it. Thanks again for being here. <laughs>